Uh, Koshi, thank you for uh, being with me here today. Yeah, my pleasure. I think we should start first because we're, we're both remote. Um, I'm based in, in New Jersey. I'm having a conversation in New Jersey today. And, and where are you? Where's your office located? In Athens, Greece. It's awesome. In actually um, the suburb town of, of Glyfada. So near a little beach. It's, it's uh, yeah, Athens. <laughs> and uh, how long have you been there? Uh, 20 years. So I was born in the uh, States and uh, moved to Greece when I was 15. So I've just been here ever since. Um, and I know that a, a lot of the, the work that you do and a, a lot of the, the, the way that you work and manage teams is, is done remotely, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think, I think it's kind of a, a good segue because, you know, you're, you started this platform, Growth Mentor, um, and I found out about it and then and signed up. But um, for the people that might not be familiar, what exactly is Growth Mentor? So it's basically a platform where you can sign up and book calls with vetted growth marketing and startup mentors and just jump on a call with them on Skype, Zoom, or Google Hangouts and just talk about your growth struggles because you know sometimes you just need to talk to somebody about what you're working on, where your challenges are, your bottlenecks, and you might not always have that person that you can bounce ideas at a high enough level, like in your immediate circle. Uh, and finding them online has always been kind of a pain uh, for me. Uh, and yeah, so like this is just a place where people that basically enjoy talking about growth uh, can get matched up with people that need help and you know want to bounce ideas with, with people who have been there done that before. Yeah, um, and how did you how did you kind of come up with this idea or like realize that this was a, a demand um, that people were, were looking for? Because it was literally a problem that that I had. So I've I've been working as head of growth for twelve years at EuroVPS which is a managed hosting provider. Uh, so we sell VPS, dedicated servers, private clouds, so on and so forth, data centers in Amsterdam, but the, com- the team's completely remote, right? And most of the people on the team are engineers, sysadmins, and uh, you know, they don't really like talking about growth marketing or anything you know, of that nature. It's just uh, you know, the black screen, SSH, and, and that's that. So being able to exchange ideas with with, with people uh, who are like-minded and are having similar challenges was always a real pain in the butt for me to do, right? Like how would you, you go on some Facebook group or whatever, but then just so much noise. And I ended up just booking calls and calls. Like I would post job postings on Upwork. This was back in like 2015 I started doing this. Uh, mm-hmm. Kind of escalated 2016, I was doing it like once every two weeks. Instead of hiring people to do the work for me because I, I just realized like, you know, I, I didn't have that, that many good experiences with agencies and freelancers, and I ended up taking too much upon myself, but uh, to help me get through that stress of essentially like wearing way too many hats for my own good, like I wanted to, to, to get feedback and validation from other people that, that had more experience than me, so I'd, instead of hiring people on Upwork, I would just talk to them. I was like, holy shit, like this really works. You know, like I would crack through learning plateaus. Like I, I used to spend a lot of time reading blog posts and watching courses. But you know, all the information you read online, it's it's not tailored to you. It's so it's growth is so nuanced, right? So it's like mm-hmm. you want to get some advice based on what exactly you're going through. So like I would, for example, like one of my favorite things to do with PPC is just do screen share and just share my my, my screen. Say, hey, look, this is how I'm setting my ad set. This is my campaign, my negatives, so on, my structure of how I'm doing everything. Like, what do you think? Am I doing it right, wrong? And uh, yeah, that that really helped me personally. And I figured. Like if it works for me, I'm just a typical dude. Probably it'll work for other people as well, and that that's essentially where the where the idea came from. Yeah, ironically enough, I was um, reading a blog post that you wrote about how to be a, a great marketer. And one of the things that stood out to me was uh, you you had a productive over T shaped, right? And yeah. w- when I kind of I I spent uh, most of my career in sales, and then recently transitioned into doing more growth marketing, and I was r- reading a bunch of articles. And like one of them was BT shaped. And then I'm looking at it. And I'm like, okay, I got to do all these things. And, but then it's not really, it's not relevant to the problem at hand. And like, if you're, if you're stringently focused on whatever that problem is at that time, then you, it's almost like you develop a skill set around that. Um, and then you kind of expand out rather than saying, I need to do these 17 different skill sets all at once. Yeah, totally. And I think that's, that's a, that's a problem that a lot of early, like, you know, new junior growth marketers face, there's all this talk about being T-shaped. 
and just being T-shaped just for the sake of being T-shaped, it's, it's not really uh, the right move most of the times because like you have serious fires that you want to put out right now, focus 100% on that, and then as you need those skills, branch out and dig deeper into them, right? And uh, I mean, that's, uh, I think that that's the number one tip I usually give to, to, to you know, newer marketers that are just starting out. Yeah, for sure. Um, it's it, it's been it's been a definite challenge for me, and I think it's interesting. Specifically, you know, you're building this platform for for startups or people that are working in in kind of maybe like like the smaller companies, or you know, they they might not have that education around them. I mean, um, the company that I'm working right now, it's it's only a like 15 to 20 employee um, company, and before this, I was at uh, you know like organizations that had 200 people, 300 people that had specific training programs or also um, roles where you were working with other people in that role. So like if you're at a SaaS company and you're an account executive, you're working on a team with an account executives, you can share best practices, you can kind of glean learnings from that team. But when you're working in growth at a startup, it's a little bit more complicated because you're probably the only person doing that thing at that time. And that was the exact situation I was in. I, I couldn't learn by osmosis. There was nobody else around me that was doing the same thing. And uh, you know, then you, you start reading online what other people are doing. It's the logical next step, right? You have to somehow fix the situation. So you're obviously going to try and educate yourself. But you know, everybody has conflicting points of view on different things, and there's multiple ways to get the same you know, results. It's, uh, and therein comes a lot of the imposter syndrome, I think. And I think people that are working remote in smaller companies, they suffer from this a lot. Like, you know, am I really any good at what I'm doing? And all these other people mm. have these crazy success stories, 10x, they've got 25,000 organic traffic with this tactic over a year, and I'm still, you know, trying to push 100 uh, organic, you know, inbounds a day. Like, what's going on? Uh, should I hire an agency, this, that, the other? So, you know, that's, that's kind of a very, that's a very large problem with, with startups that just have two, three people inside of them, you know, like, where, who are you really going to, uh, to turn to? And then, uh, yeah, just having having that support group um, is is super useful. And how are you thinking about um, building growth mentor to to solve those specific problems? Uh, it's it's in the essence, it's about the people uh, behind it, and what we're the way that we're solving that is we're vetting the mentors, and we're trying to find mentors that uh, a like they have the hard skill set and that track record to prove that they've actually done it because there's a lot of people that talk a big game, right? But, you know, have they actually brought results and fruitful results of their, of their journey so far? And, and B, and this is, I think, the most critical part and what really differentiates is we're, we're looking for people that actually enjoy helping and talking about growth, right? Because not everybody has that same mindset. Like, some people are really closed with their information. They don't want to share it because they feel like, you know, somehow, like, other people are going to get an edge, like zero sum, but that's, I, I, I don't understand that logic, but uh, yeah, I mean, this is just from my experience of starting out in the beginning is like people I was speaking to, they generally really liked talking about growth. They were passionate about it, passionate about helping other people that were in a similar situation that they were in maybe a couple of years back, right? So having that mindset of like giving giving back a bit uh, to people that could that were in your position, uh, it's it's one of the things that we look for in growth mentors. And uh, you know, that's, that's essentially how to go back to your question, like how we're solving that, that problem for people. We're finding people that know what they're talking about and at the same time like actually do want to help and aren't doing it exclusively for like that hourly rate or you know, some sort of a stipend. So, yeah. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it, it's something that I've kind of, I've kind of looked at and, and thought about as well. Something else from your article you were talking about um, kind of how active learning is, is better than passive learning, right? Um, and, and that's that's another thing. Like, if you can if you can do a screen share that that half hour or forty five minutes that you spend with someone that has done it for ten years is going to be able to pinpoint a lot of a lot of things for you, and you can you can work and actually make those changes with them um, much more better than like reading a blog article. It totally makes yeah, sense. Yeah, I mean, I I used. To one of my, I mean, so many times, like I've jumped on a call with because I use the platform as well. And I get stuck with Google Tag Manager like quite frequently, uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, you know, it's happened a lot of times. I jump on 15 minutes later, it's like, okay, that's it. That was that was pretty simple. You know, you learn that, you commit that to memory, and you know, you move on rather than just wasting all this time trying to watch another course. You know, the full 
14 hour sequence on how to become an expert at XYZ when you don't, you really only need that 1%. That's really what you need for that. Again, that's short, focusing on the short term. Uh, right. Which, you know, if you're a startup, you have to be moving fast, fast, fast. So, like, you know, if there is some sort of a roadblock, find exactly what that is, isolate it, and then kind of reverse engineer how can you break that down uh, and, and, and get over that hurdle uh, in the least amount of time as possible. And I think that that plays into the whole growth mindset and, and what it really means to be a, a growth marketer. Um, one, of the, one of the challenges that, that I've seen is specifically working on a startup, being able to know what you're measuring and then impact that, that measurement um, in a productive way and not trying to experiment on, on things that maybe you aren't tracking correctly or also experiment on things where the difference or the change in performance might be so incremental that you're not actually able to, to glean it. I guess I'm saying a couple of different things here, but like one of, one of the challenges that, that I face is actually being able to identify like, are we, am I doing a lot of rigorous small tests or am I, am I making more big bets? So kind of being able to like understand big bets for small bets in a, in a startup is, has been something that I've kind of thought about. Yeah, um, that's that's definitely a, a, a really big part of uh, of experimentation. You know, you, I mean, the big bets. I think that's that's generally where it's at in the beginning, earlier stage. I don't really have that much experience working in large startups with a tremendous amount of of of, of data, like you know, where you can actually do these small tests and have statistical significance. Uh, and you know, if you don't really have that much traffic or traction in the beginning, you have to make these sort of radical tests. And uh, uh, at the same time, like, what, what's your opinion on statistical significance in your experimentation? Or do you do you, do you always go for that 90, 95th percentile? Or yeah, I mean, I I I think that I would like that to I would like that to be the case. But what I've realized is that um, the changes that I'm making, like, are if if we have like a Basically, like, say our our KPI is new investors, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> in the in the platform that I work for, it's a it's a fintech app, um, so we're trying to gain investors. And because uh, the the frequency of, of new investors coming in, um, it's it's pretty small. Like being able to split test the campaign and say this campaign drew more results, it's difficult because it might only drive five more investors. So it's like do you then optimize for more upstream metrics or look at more upstream metrics as a test? Um, so I guess like, how do you, how do you think about that when you're talking to a startup that maybe like the amount of customers, or maybe it's like a, a B2B company where they're, uh, where the sales cycle is a little bit longer, they're getting less, less customers, and they want to run a test. How do you think about, um, do we optimize for that metric that you care about most, or do we kind of, look for a second metric which we can which is more upstream which we can then impact um, that we're able to actually see like bigger results from yeah great question I think it, it, it's like kind of separating the forest from the trees a little bit and the, the method that I do to kind of keep myself grounded on that is I use this framework the OKRs right so you know when just have that you have to have this high level objective what you're trying to do right which is it doesn't necessarily have to be like a, a, a quantitative metric in a sense. It could be like our objective is to validate that out, outbound works, right? And then break down what, 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 I mean, that's, that's for me, that's literally like the objective that I have right now. Like it's, does it work? I'm trying it out right now. You know, then you have your, your key results below that will help you uh, kind of realize whether that objective has been actuated or not. Um, and uh, yeah, the key results could be that upstream metric that you have, but it could also be the downstream one. You have the multiple, you know, you have experiments running in parallel for all of those different key results, but at the same time not losing focus of what that core objective is. When you get a, um, well, first off, how many, how many calls have you been on like yourself um, with people that come to mentor and ask you questions? Uh, 150, I think. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that, I mean, that's a, that's a good amount of data. No. <laughs> but yeah, I think it's like a hundred, hundred and something. It's a good amount of data to go off of. Um, what are, I guess, what are the main challenges or what are the first things when you get on a call with somebody 
like you're seeing that they're making they're making a mistake. Is there any kind of uniformity between those those conversations, those calls? Um, I mean, it depends based on what stage the startup's in. Because I've spoken to people that are like super early, like we're talking ideation, and then you know scale scale up startups, which Honestly, like I'm probably not the best person for them to talk to for that because I have no real experience working in like super high scale. Like the biggest company I've ever worked in, the EuroVPS has like 20 employees, right? right. And that's after 12 years. So, uh, but generally, like I, I enjoy conversations with earlier stage startups that I can kind of relate to, right? And for 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 me, what they're the biggest challenges that they have is this. Like, how do I prioritize what to do for my go-to market strategy? What should I focus on first? There's so many different uh, channels that I can experiment on, and uh, I am just conflicted. So there's there's just a lot of uh, conflicted content out there, and, and and people telling you know experts, gurus, whatever, saying you know I have to do this. Right. Facebook has retargeting, organic. It's you know, or it's only outbound, or it's only inbound. Uh, and I, I think that there's just a lot of confusion out there. Uh, and you know the the advice that I that I always give is kind of like focus on, on on one or two or three things. I mean, if you're really early stage, it's not a crime to like try many things at the same time. You just do the quantity thing, right? And then like see, kind of, you gotta get this gut feeling as well. And I also also like you know you don't really have to be like 95 percentile and like you can you can use your gut a little bit. Like I, I like to call it like data influence versus data driven. Um, you know, all of course like measure things, but. Uh, yeah, going. I feel like I'm diverging a little bit from your initial question, but generally, though, yeah, it's a lot of a lot of confusion about uh, prioritization and and how to structure their their daily workflows. Um, like, what should I actually be doing? You know, because I speak to a lot of founders that also have to do the marketing themselves. Well, <clears throat> another thing is, it's like you can make a lot of bets, but did it work? And a lot of times, I mean, something that I went through uh, last quarter specifically is I was doing a lot of tests on, on different channels. So, you know, I was, I was running Facebook, but also like Twitter and Apple search and doing some stuff on uh, Quora, doing some stuff on like UAC, running um, universal app campaigns on Google. Um, and I was kind of like looking at the metrics and saying, okay, this is a good cost per install, whatever, this, this is working. Um, but I wasn't, I didn't have like an experimentation framework and I wasn't like concluding the results of the test and I wasn't documenting it. I think that's, that's something it's like when you focus on one to three things at a time, it's like make sure that if you're going to decide to focus on something that you're going to track it, you're, you're going to have like a either like an end date or a, a hypothesis and, and you treat it very strategically rather than just a lot of times it's almost like you want to throw shit at the wall and, and see, see what sticks. Um, this year I'm trying to be a lot more specific like before I think about running something, what's the hypothesis, what am I trying to solve and like am I going to be able to track this and, and have like a retro afterwards to be able to learn something from it? Absolutely. I mean, that is so key. You have to, you have to track it. I mean, that's, that's a, that's a big like pitfall that, that I, that I fell in in the earlier years. And then like afterwards I found this sort of structure that works. Uh, just have a, it's, I keep it super lean. I just have a Google sheet with a list of all of my different experiments and then a link to the Google doc, which has the experiment kind of breakdown, the experiment ID, the hypothesis, the results and then the kind of like the post-mortem, like what actually happened afterwards. Uh, because, you know, it's just a pity, right, to do all of this work and like, I, because the biggest gain really is the learnings from it, right? It's not really like, oh yeah, I increased my conversion rate by 2.3%, like, great, <laughs> you know, like. Right, <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. <laughs> um, what, uh, what, are some, what are some tests that you're running right now to, at Growth Mentor? Uh, they're mostly outbounds. Uh, tests. I mean, uh, I, I, I'm running a, a couple of different tests. Uh, we're, we have some uh, campaigns that we're running and we're just split testing uh, messaging. So one is like super conversational uh, and the other is like hardcore, like this is who we are, this is, you know, like sell, sell basically like a hard sell. Um, and in terms of like inbound test conversion rate and, and performance and all that, I put a complete pause on any PPC, not that I was really doing PPC before, I was doing a little bit of retargeting, but uh, we're, we're working on some new product stuff right now and we're rebuilding our onboarding and, and so on, so like I just didn't really want to waste any money right now before we launched that. But uh, I, I feel like now's a really good time to, to, to do outbound because I view outbound more so than just like as a lead gen, it's a way to learn, 
like really quickly about sentiment sure. and, and what people are interested in and what messaging really resonates with them. You know, I, I know a lot of people do that as well with headlines on AdWords and you can test different value props and so on. But for me, like what really works, what I really enjoy doing is testing all of that stuff on cold audiences with, with outbounds. Um, another thing that, that I remember reading in, in the article you wrote is talking about just like becoming a great writer. Uh, that's a that's a big one that that I've noticed. I mean, throughout the years, even being in sales, you got to get good at writing. But um, being a good being a good marketer is really being a good writer. And something that I've uh, struggled with, and and I'm trying to get better at, is being able to like say say something very succinctly in as few words as possible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I, that just, was, it's challenge as well. I think it's everyone's challenge, like right? because it's so much easier to say more. Right, just, right. Like, yeah, and and when you take you know you take these uh, the complex ideas and but so the I think the shift that that I've made in that perspective is like trying to really uh, respect the customer journey and understand that if you're solving a complex product, you do not have to say everything in one ad. And you can mm -hmm. really break things down throughout the, the journey. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, totally. I, I, one more, one more, one more tip that I that I had. It really, I heard this one thing from uh, I was at this growth hacking conference, and something really resonated with me on, on how how they how they did different experiments. Let's say you want to make a, an experiment on a landing page, for example, and it's a new landing page or even a new product, and you want to test it. Uh, a lot of marketers will add adjectives to the to the headline to accentuate and add flair to what the product is but when you're starting out just very dry what it is without any marketing copy right like the best this that whatever you know like just super dry what it is and then have that as a baseline reading and then you add in any sort of like you know edgy punchy copy uh, just yeah, something that that kind of stuck with me, and it it kind of reels me in a little bit because I get in this habit of when I when I'm writing copy, like I I, I try and go all out from the beginning, and then right. it kind of gets, it, you know, you just just have to like what what is it? Because many times we overdo it, and then like you show it to somebody like I don't get it, like what what is this? You know, that, I I say that to a lot of mentees that I speak to. They they write they send me a Google Docs before. I always ask them like you know please send me a small Google Doc telling me what your product is. And I'm reading it, it's like this big paragraph block. Right, like, right. I don't understand what this is. Can you just tell it to me in one sentence? You know, and if you've ever done like a Y Combinator application or anything like that, you'll know the importance of conciseness. Um, talk to me a little bit about Y Combinator and actually kind of, so something that, that I've been thinking about, you know, we there there's Upwork, there's, there's different freelancing sites, there's different sites that you can go on to kind of work with work with consultants I wonder from like a, a partnerships pr perspective um, would you ever think about like working with working with you know someone like Y Combinator or um, uh, another like a uh, accelerator um, something along those lines to to kind of expand the growth mentor do you think about that it's funny that you, it's funny that you say that because literally the call I was on right before was with another one of the growth mentors who's one of, a manager at a, at a VC firm and uh, she asked, like, if we could do some sort of a potential partnership or deal for her their portfolio. And I was like, I immediately got this sort of like aha moment, like, holy shit, this is probably like what I should be doing because, you know, it's at scale, kind of getting the the value across to to to, to a large group of startups that really need it. But yeah, absolutely, you know, I think that that could be a, a big thing. I don't know about Y Combinator; they rejected my application twice. But, oh really? Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> What um how how do you how do you view failure? I mean, because like at a startup you're failing all the time, right? But like, and what I realize is a lot of the people that that work in the space, the more people that I talk to startups, like they're so passionate and like they just want to do shit. They want to make cool shit, and it, I, I but at the same time that comes with failure. Yeah. Like when you when you fail from Y Combinator, it's part of you like. I'm going to show these guys a little bit. Do you have that kind of like? The first time I was like, I sucked. I made a really shitty application because I did. It was like the night before. But the second time I was like, dude, come on. Like, 
<laughs> I, you know, why? But it's yeah, and at that point, it kind of lit a fire in my ass. I was like, you know, what? I don't, I don't need any sort of like Y Combinator or any accelerator or VCs or whatever. We, I got this, you know. And I was like, yeah, you do kind of get that 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 fire that you know you want to you want to prove somebody and you, you that. You need that as well, but it's not. It, that's not enough, though. You like have to literally be passionate about what you're doing because if you're doing it to prove other people wrong, your mom, your dad, your mm-hmm. girlfriend, whatever, like it's only gonna last X, you know, amount, and then you're gonna burn out and then like go to your nine to five job again. But I mean, you really have to be passionate about it and believe in 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 what you're doing. And like me, like I really like talking to other people in growth, so it's like, you know, it's kind of a like even if it doesn't. Like I'm comfortable with the fact that you know this might not ever be this multi-million dollar thing. I'm cool with that. Like I still like what I'm doing and I enjoy the process of it. And if like if you do that, I really believe in you know that it it ultimately you will become successful as long as you keep adding value to people with what you're doing. You don't screw anybody over, right? And like you know just keep being persistent. You know at some point it'll 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 pay off. But yeah, I mean failure is super important though because that's that's really the best way to to learn. Talking about act active learning versus passive learning. I mean, active learning, like in its core, is just learning from doing things. And most of the things you're going to do in growth or in the startup space, they're not going to work. Like right. most of the stuff <laughs> you do doesn't, doesn't work. Like I've tried so many things and, you know, like I, when I started, I was like, yeah, within one year, we'll be like having 10,000 users and this and that, like all these crazy ideas. We're going to love it. But like, it's, it really is a lot harder than, uh, than anybody really thinks. Yeah, it's like a lot of times if you if you create if you you build out your resume, it, it's always going to be the high level KPIs of like, you know, I, I I grew the user base to to X amount or achieved this this row ass goal, um, but I want to see a blog post like what's the thirty five mistakes that you made, <laughs> because yeah. the, the more experienced people probably have more mistakes and that just makes them better i mean uh, like when i've i've been doing this while i've been i've been working at rally now um for like seven months and um i've done some things right i've done a lot of things wrong but it's like the things that i that i've done wrong i'm not going to do again yeah 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 Um, for sure but it's you know there's there's certain there's certain there's certain mistakes that if you make them though like they're almost like ele like extension extinction level events i like to call them because in the hosting industry like there's failure and like you can't really certain failures you're not allowed to do like you know your router you know you don't have redundancy there you don't have backups and then you lose all your customers data you're you're gone right like there's certain yeah. things in any startups like that 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 you cannot make and it's like in the that and I think that's I again like going into the whole like growth mentor thing I, this is not really a sales pitch but I really do believe it but I I, I think that if you talk to other people that have been there done that that's the best way to you know, to minimize the risk of those types of like critical core failures that 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 you make. Like for example, I I speak often to people that are thinking about you know hiring agencies or doing some sort of big move where it's like a lot of their money and resources, and you know those sort of mistakes can can really screw you over. It's like yeah, and that's that's where you could use a little bit of a a, a bouncing thing. Ma- making smaller, more intentional bets where it's smaller, like, more yeah. intentional bets, yeah, versus like you know all in type, you know rash rash decisions, uh, which I have I have made um, and <laughs> I threw a UPS before, and honestly, like if the company wasn't as profitable as it was back then, like it could have been very bad, uh, but it recovered, uh, and uh, yeah, mo- most of most of those mistakes had to do with hiring. Uh, wrong, wrong agencies or, or contractors, or, or making certain big bets that, uh, that in hindsight were really kind of silly. But uh, and what do you um, so when making those decisions about like hire agencies and, and if you have people that are asking you about them, what type of things do you, would you would you ask somebody who's who's telling you you know I want to hire this agency? It's the due it's due diligence, like really understanding. Uh, all of your all, all of your options as well because I think there's you know we're emotional beings and 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 we we make decisions based on emotions and we use data to kind of rationalize those emotional decisions so when it comes to hiring especially like agencies and so on we're we're very subjected subject subjective is that a word yeah to like the the, the, the sales pitches and the hope right of right. this sort of change that's going to happen and 
you know, there's again going back to the to the to the thing we talked about earlier. Like, there's many ways to do the right thing, and you just have to be cognizant of all your alternatives. And I, I, that's really, I think, where people kind of screw up. Yeah, it's like we, our full time job is user psychology, is understanding how to get individuals to convert using like the emotion and logic framework. <laughs> But yeah. then, but then we're we're persuaded, and we don't realize that it's happening to us either. Yeah, yeah, no, and it, it has. It, I mean, we're we're all human, so it's there <laughs> for sure. Um, so let me ask you because you you spent a long time as VP of growth, and it's something that you know I'm. I would I would say that I'm a little bit. I I don't have the specific experience working like in growth marketing for years and years to be able to move into a VP of growth role right now. But um, for people that might be more entry level or maybe, you know, two to three years into their um, growth career, whether that be someone in product or engineering or marketing, and they're saying to themselves, you know, I want to be a, a VP of growth one day. I want to lead growth at an organization. Um, how would you think about developing maybe like a like a, a five year uh, goal or like a five year uh, path to to get to that type of level? What things would you think about developing? What what kind of experiences or learnings would you think about going after? Yeah, great great question. So for for me, it was it was a different case than than a lot of the other people that I'm supposed to be answering this question for because I was the first non-engineering hire. And like, it, I just sort of grew with the company and it just kind of came naturally. Like I wasn't like promoted or anything like that. But uh, if I, like what I, what helped me a lot in my personal development was creating like little side projects to experiment on and to, you know, prove that, that, that you, you're, you know, you like to create things as well because VP of growth roles, I think that there's this trend that I'm noticing that people are hiring like ex founders uh, to, to, to take these roles because you, you need that sort of experience of that. You need that like at that work ethic, like you're going to get shit done no matter what, like you're going to find a way you have to be able to have that grit to find a way no matter what. And a good way to develop that is by creating things from scratch because it helps your confidence as well. So I would definitely suggest making like a side project that could be as simple as just a blog. I had created a couple of, you know, little baby blogs just to, to experiment different things with SEO and, and, and kind of learn how things work without ruining the, 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 the website at your right. yes, but yeah, things like that uh, are, 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 are definitely useful. Um, what do you, uh, what are you currently reading and, and do you read a lot? I am embarrassed to say that I have not been reading that much lately um, because I'm just extremely like busy and I, I, I used to read a lot of, of, of business books and, 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 and blog posts and listen to podcasts but like recently I, I reached this point where I just kind of burned out from all of that because I'm constantly talking about it and like I just want to unplug a bit right now uh, from all that but if I would recommend um, are you asking for like recommendations of like books or something or? <laughs> no, well, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering like, you know, we have like being, being a good growth marketer, just like building your career in general, there's, there's, you know, specific career knowledge that you could gain. But then uh, my perspective is that there's a lot of things that you do like outside of work that can help you to be better at work. Um, and it might not even be like reading you know, a book specifically on user psychology or business. It, it could be yeah. like going to uh, a museum. Like there's this, there's this really good book, um, uh, Julia Cameron, and, and she talks about the artist date. And she talks about basically like one day a month uh, going to do something for yourself, by yourself, uh, that's specifically creative, whether that be like going for a, a walk in a park or painting or going to a museum, something like that. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, you need to derive sort of influences from things that are not not work related as well, um, and 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 giving yourself some time to to unplug and, and and kind of channel that creativity through means that you actually enjoy. Like I I used to be really into when I was younger into into drawing, 
but I, I've, I've kind of given that up. But just generally, though, like writing um, things that have nothing to do with with with, with work whatsoever. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's I'm I'm really guilty of of, of not really being a balanced uh, individual in, in in that sense. I've been way too much into 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 my work, uh, but like I'm currently at that point where. I just I feel like I have no choice really, um, but it's, right. uh, you know, I'll, I'll admit it. You know, like I'm I'm a workaholic. The last last year I've been working like seven days a week and it's just very few, very little time to to, to fully unplug. Uh, and that's that's why like you know it's, it's like this carrot in front of you. Like I like yeah I'm gonna work really hard so that at some point I can afford to fully unplug. Um, sure. But uh, you know life life passes extremely quick and uh, you know you you have to really try and, and have that balance uh, in the meanwhile otherwise like what's a what what's the point well i mean clearly like you're very passionate about about growing this business and i i mean i feel like the the demand for it is so clean right now um you know you've been working in growth a while like where do you where do you see it going um do you do you think that people getting involved should be heavier on the so okay my perspective is that like people that should that are getting involved in it now should be heavier on the the product side um one of the one of the things for me transitioning into kind of like working in growth for a brand rather than doing enterprise sales um when i was working in advertising like we were just very focused on kind of like the top line metrics of like uh, this is our uh, CPA. Um, you know, this is our like average order size right now. This is our ROAS. Um, but the the shift that I've kind of had is like focusing specifically on retention. <clears throat> and so, like, if you're focused on retention, what are the skill sets that you need as a growth professional professional to be able to like hit that goal uh, a little bit better? Uh, and be really good at product analytics. Yeah, like that's 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 incredibly important and to understand how to set up events, uh, you know, how to set up your funnel properly. I mean, whatever tool you're using, mix panel, amplitudes, uh, and then also to have, I think it's really important to have kind of like the soft skills to create customer success uh, um, programs for the team. But I know that kind of falls into the whole customer. Su- There's a whole other department for that, but I used to do that as well at EuroVPS. So uh, really understanding the, the the life cycle, every single touch point of, uh, of of the customer journey, and like what you can do at every single one of those touch points to influence the sort of KPI at that at that point, um, right? So like at EuroVPS, for example, you would sign up, you would get the onboarding email, um, then after three days, you would get another email saying, hey. Do you want us to add you to the proactive monitoring system? All right, what percentage of the people replied to that email and said, yes, sure, I'll do it, All right? And then 14 days later, another touch point, something else of value. So it's all about continuously adding value and really differentiating yourself from everybody else in your industry by some sort of service element, which is really just just people putting a little bit extra effort. I think that's, that's a really, good way to differentiate yourself in a crowded marketplace by doing things that maybe like you know do things that don't scale but right if you think about it like they are kind of scalable by just setting up some sort of a sequence that just continuously drips out certain uh trip wires where they can then uh then it's kind of like semi-automated i like semi-automated customer success workflows where you, you automate the process of getting a value point in front of them but then it's up to them whether they want to reply and redeem that. And then it's just some process that you've created with your customer success team that creates that like wow factor, like holy crap, like they went out of their way and they did this for me and they didn't really have to. You know, things like that are extremely effective to reducing uh, churn rates. I think churn, churn is like super important to, 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 to really have an eye on that, you know, where, where you're going. Um, now that I'm now that I'm on the, the the kind of like the brand direct side where I'm managing a, a budget, I'm getting the emails and pitches from the same from salespeople that I used to be. Um, and so when I was on the sales side, when, when I was on the sales side, I was trying to sell the marketers. Um, it's very easy to want to automate a lot of that stuff. Create create very you know simple email sequences that say the same thing over and over. Um, and now that I'm on the marketing side, I see those emails come in. It's just noise to me. 
like I, uh, and it's, and it's, it's such a challenge um, to be like an outbound salesperson to, to kind of like to do that. But um, if you're, if you're trying to sell to a few people, like it makes sense to kind of personalize the, the message a little bit. Yeah. Uh, there's, uh, there's a trade off uh, of personalization versus um, just kind of like merge tag style personalization, right? Where it's semi and like finding that, <laughs> finding that point where it's like, is where is it worth the ROI to put that extra time? Um, it, it just comes from testing both approaches. Like one of the things that I, 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 I heard from, I was interviewing Dave Schneider about like, he's a mentor on the platform. He was the founder of Ninja Outreach, like really big on SEO and, and, and link building in particularly. And I'm like, dude, what, at what point, like let's say for example you wanted to do an outbound campaign for link building and you want 100% personalized emails uh, and um, basically like personalization versus semi-personalization. At what mm -hmm. point is, is it not worth it to to go, is, what's the point of diminishing returns basically with, with uh, personalization because you're just, it's just not scalable. Uh, and uh, you know the same thing can apply not just to, to link building to like sales as well, right? Like you only just have to test it. Send 100 emails, like completely fully personalized, and then send 100 semi-personalized with merge tags, and uh, you know, and see what your conversion rate is from, you know, from A to Z. Yeah, for sure. Um, that's one of the things that I'm I'm testing right now at at Rally. Um, every week we have kind of specific initial offerings. So basically, what we do is we securitize rare assets. Uh, we take. Uh, um, a baseball card, a uh, Honus Wagner baseball card. Um, we take Michael Jordan uh, game-worn sneakers and we convert them into stock. And so every week or every couple of weeks, we have an initial offering the first time we're having an individual asset offered on the platform. So part of my strategy is, has obviously been to kind of like target those specifically, but then part of the strategy is to advertise more broadly of, this is what Rally is. This is what R Rally does. Um, so now I'm kind of testing, like, what's the better way to acquire investors? Is it to do these, like, week-long sprints where it's, like, we're very focused around activation of a specific asset? Or is it to do a more general kind of branding play and then let people discover it more organically? And what's, uh, what, what seems to be working uh, better? Or is it still an ongoing uh, experiment? It's ongoing, but uh, activation seems to be working better. Um, it seems to be when you tell the, the person's story about an individual asset and then they come on via that, that asset, um, they convert more directly. The funnel's a little bit more uh, cleaner. And I think the, the other thing is that I'm realizing is it has a better impact on retention. Um, and it's, it's like the, the closer you can get someone to, to the aha moment. And right now the aha moment I think is becoming an investor what I'm starting to try to think about and I'm continuing to think about is like, how do I bring that aha moment a little bit more upstream um, so that they, they get the platform and they're interested and they're engaged with it uh, before actually having to go through to become an investor. So these are, are these cold uh, prospects that you're reaching out to? Yeah. So now, now I'm doing uh, that and retargeting. Um, so the, the, this, in this year, I'm much more heavier focused on retargeting. Um, simply because I've realized that like we have a, a longer sales cycle it takes someone maybe like a little bit longer to become an investor at certain times or or they can convert right away um, but the the issue is that like we really need to be getting the message of the individual asset in, the, in people's faces a lot um, and so the focus more is on retargeting now so kind of get them get them into your funnel get them pixeled and then let retargeting kind of nurture them throughout the next 90 days or whatever, right? Exactly. And I mean, and I think the other thing with, with Rally specifically is that because it is a, a new idea, it takes time to understand. And one of the things that I started doing last year was like really trying to explain it um, up front. Like this is how Rally works. This is how initial offerings work. This is how you trade shares. But then um, something that I'm working more towards now is like letting them understand that um, kind of more naturally over a certain time period. Um, and again, like with, with Rally specifically, like they're going to invest because it's the game, uh, game Warren Jordan sneakers, not I, more so that than like 
this is a great investment that's going to outperform the S and P 500. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's that's the kind of shift I'm I'm making. Um, Have you tried Instagram? Yeah, yeah. Instagram's huge. So we're actually. <laughs> Uh, for sure. I mean, right now we're, we have, uh, I, I said the game worn, uh, sneakers, um, tomorrow we're doing an offering for Michael Jordan, um, game worn sneakers from 1988. And we, um, I'm kind of, I created a, a 30 second video ad that I'm going to start using for other offerings that basically tells the story of the asset, um, uses a combination of like the actual picture of the Jordan game worn sneakers with like culture shots of him dunking him playing basketball that that type of thing and that's something that that's been i mean like i've gotten really a lot better at kind of just like ad design creative design storytelling um because with with our assets you know we might have a picture of a watch and that's cool like in a in a white background but like if you can take a culture shot of like jay-z wearing the watch or the watch getting made and you can kind of use the combination of that stuff it, it really tells a better story nice 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 yeah i think i think instagram could be like pretty amazing for you guys uh, in terms of uh getting it out there but what's the um are you using cold cold audiences for that as well or how do you i'm just curious like how you would be able to isolate people that are interested in these things but also could be potential investors yeah, so um, I mean the, the retargeting side is one thing, but for, on like the on the prospecting like net new, um, yeah. I've done mostly broad audiences for for Facebook, um, testing a little bit of lookalikes now and then also some interest based stuff. Um, but one of the I think one of the challenges there is like I think it's I don't think it's as much audience as it is the optimization point. So like when what I'm trying to get better at is like understanding is it smarter to optimize for app installs or is it smarter to optimize for a down a downstream metric because the investments only take place maybe once a week it's hard to optimize for that you can't optimize for an investment occurring on a Friday when you're running a campaign on a Monday um, so I'm kind of like still playing around with it still trying yeah, to yeah, yeah makes sense yeah um, so I know I know we have uh, a couple minutes left. I think, like, I, I wanted to end more, more so in like a, a moment of reflection because, um, you know, 2020, like, it's, it's funny. It is a new decade, and it's weird. Like, I, I turned 30 in November, um, so like the decades kind of coincide with like the decades of my life, um, and it's weird. Like, you know, the 2010s, like I was, uh, those, those were my, those were my 20s, right? Um, and I travel a lot. I did a lot of cool things, and like now it's like my 30s and uh, it makes me feel old, but then also I'm like, I'm not old yet. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's, it's the third. Everyone that I've talked to is like 30s are, are great. So, but I have been more reflective and I feel like I've kind of like matured a lot, just like having that three in my age for whatever reason. Um, but I wonder like going into 2020, um, I'm sure you reflected a lot on growth mentor. Like what do, what do the next 10 years look like for you? And you can't predict the future, but like, what are you what are you excited about in this new decade? Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm I'm also in my 30s. I'm a little bit older than you, 34 right now. I just turned, but uh, the next decades, man, like I just want to, to 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 really make a sort of change in the perception of people that have reached a certain point in their careers and like motivate them to to, to give back through through uh, through just health. Like I just it's something so raw about just having a call with somebody and just having a chat uh, without any sort of expectations that they're going to solve your problem. Um, and, you know, just educating people about the value of having that genuine, genuine uh, human to human connection in an era where everyone's swiping and clicking and there's just so much, so much noise. Uh, and I think that like we're all becoming sort of like avatars in a sense, right? Online. Right. Uh, and we're, we're losing that connection. So just doubling down on, on what, what's working right now, I, I can't predict what's going what, what's gonna to be the case in a year from now or two years in terms of growth, like what we're going to do with products. But, uh, you know, I, I definitely have some, some ideas in terms of kind of branching out and offering uh, the ability for, for earlier stage startups to, uh, to, to, to create growth teams um, as well, kind of distribute it and let, this is sort of like a in a lab idea, but I'll 
drop it over here on, on growth on, on, on your podcast. But like imagine all the growth mentors like self formulating into different sort of squads and being able to be hired by by startups on the platform. So I think that's that's something I'm really excited about over the next uh, next year or so. Cool. Um, I'll be interested to to pay attention and, and watch. <laughs> um, awesome, uh, Fody. Thank you. Thank you so much again, man. It was, uh, it was fun. Yeah, my pleasure.